So, the Cabo course. After announcing it on the last podcast, we've gotten some questions. Yes, it's as awesome as it looks. Yes, it's an extremely family-friendly place. And yes, Haney will be wearing his C-string. Of course, not around the kids. Now, the last time we went to Cabo, there may be some pictures that certain people pray won't ever get out. But this year, we specifically wanted to go somewhere we could bring our families. This place is amazing for kids and families. Perfect way to take your family on an incredible winter vacation in a uh, tax-efficient manner. Having fun doesn't disqualify the tax deduction. Look it up, people. Tons of fun, killer education, on the beach. Come join us. Register at CaboFest2017.com and now enjoy some long ultrasound education. If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds, some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs. Let us know how you feel about it. Uh, he's slightly intoxicated. You know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> so I'm about 15 minutes over my limit of talking about studies and evidence. Right. Teach me how to use this in my patients. All right, I can do that. Do you, do you mind if we start with pulmonary edema first? This is your world. All right. So let's talk about the probe first. The curvilinear probe is going to be your best probe to do this. It's got a good combination of high frequency with uh, good penetrance. Your phase rate transducer will also work, but if you have to choose between the two, I definitely use that curvilinear probe first. Now, Matt, I want to show you what not a B-line looks like or not pulmonary edema looks like. What do you think A-line stands for, the A? I'm kind of thinking maybe awesome, but then I think probably Avila if I really had to Yeah, no, you're totally right. This is the Avila line. And the Avila line is not It's not air. It's air. air. Okay. Yeah, it's air. Um, But can we get that going? Can we call it the Avila line? Yeah, let's start it. All right. So you can see A lines in a normal lung for sure, but you also see them in pneumothorax and you see that in obstructive airways disease. The A line, which is air, you see it anytime you have predominantly air in the thorax. So when people say it means normal, it doesn't. It just means that there's predominantly air. Do you see the A line here? I see it. It's a bright white line below the pleural line. Uh, you're talking about this right here? Pleural line. So this is the pleural line. Is that an A line? Nope. Below it. Right there? There you go. A line, A line, A line, A line. These are uh, reverberation artifacts that happen when you have air in the thorax. And now, Matt, have you ever wondered exactly how they're made? You know that keeps me up at night. Of course I wonder how it's made. Who hasn't wondered how that's made? I know that about you. I know that it keeps you up at night. So I made a graphic for you. Uh, do you like this graphic? It looks good so far. Yeah, so far. So what happens is when you have an interface between air and tissue, or air and fluid, I mean, it's tissue in this sense, you actually create a very reflective surface for sound. The ultrasound transducer sends out a sound beam, and when something reflects back, when it gets an echo... Echo, echo. It determines how deep that structure is. So one ultrasound beam will come down, hit that pleura, come back to the transducer. It took T amount of time. What will happen is another one will come down, hit that pleural line, hit the skin, hit the pleural line, hit the skin, and it took two T for it to come back. So it thinks, hey, there's another pleural line here, and so on and so forth. So the ultrasound machine is not very smart, nope. but us being smarter and knowing that it's not very smart, I feel like we could use that. Exactly, exactly right. These are artifacts. They're not real structures, but they're structures that are definitely useful for us. Do you, do you see the A-line here? Yeah, I see it. What do you think of this? A little different, right? I don't know. Make it move. All right, I'll make it move just for you. This is a B line. We have a plural line up here. It extends the B line extends from that plural line all the way down, extends to the bottom of the screen, and moves with respiration. Those are the three kind of criteria for B lines. Now, I know that the A line thing kept you up at night. Hopefully, I've kind of helped you out with that. Now, I know that for me personally, the A line keeps you up. The B line keeps me up. So I made myself a little graphic here to try and think about exactly how it's formed. So you imagine it this way. You have a small fluid-filled structure like an alveolus surrounded by air-filled structures or other alveoli that haven't quite had fluid in them. And remember I mentioned it, when you have fluid right next to air, it creates a very reflective surface for sound. And what happens is that sound beam will come back and hit hit all the corners and make that noise. And as it makes that noise that you're making with with your mouth there, you see how it just it creates all these tiny reverberation artifacts, and that is how beelines are formed. Okay, so what about, I've heard about this interlobular septal thickening thing. Right, so that is definitely a component of how beelines are formed. So the, the theory is, as you get fluid in your interlobular septa, the spaces in between your terminal uh, sacs of alveoli, that it creates the beelines. And that's definitely a component, but I think that it's more than that. I think on top of the interlobular septa being thickened, I think that the alveoli themselves can form these beelines as well. Okay, as okay, okay, okay. So as soon as you said terminal sacs, I immediately regretted asking you the Fair question. Enough. Can you just tell me how to use this? 
in my patient? So basically the minimum they need to know, all you really need to know is the following. So you need to know that when you see these beelines, it means pulmonary edema and it's due to increased fluid. That's bottom line. Beelines always mean pulmonary edema? Well, no, not always. But you, you asked me to talk it, you know, describe okay. it simplistically. So it usually that means is, more fluid. It means more fluid. Okay. Now let's look at this A-line here. You see the A-line? See it? Compare that to ZB line. You see the difference here? We have the plural line with the A line, and we have a bunch of B lines coming off of here. This is edema. This is air. Totally see it. Totally see it. Now, Matt, to actually diagnose someone with diffuse interstitial syndrome or cardiogenic pulmonary edema, you have to divide it into Volpicelli's four zones of the lung. So four zones per side. You can divide it based off of the sternum, the anterior axillary line, and then you use the uh, the nip, the, the nip, nip line. line. That's the right yeah, here. That's the formal. That's the formal Word way. For that's it. actually how Volpicelli described it, actually. That's the the international nomenclature, yeah. Um, so it doesn't matter the actual numbers here, just that there's four zones uh, per side. And for you to have a positive zone, you have to have three or more B lines per zone. And for you to have diffuse interstitial syndrome or pulmonary edema, you need to have two positive zones per side. Now, Matt, I kind of a little bit lied to you. What did you, what did you lie about? Well, you know how earlier you said like you wanted it as simple as possible, and then I said it just means fluid. Yeah. Well, that that's not actually true. What it really means, B lines, is that there's increased density. I know that's like a, one step above and maybe a little bit hard, but any time that you might have increased density in the lung, you're going to have B lines. These are situations where you have increased density in the lungs. Cardiogenic pulmonary edema for sure. Also, interstitial lung disease, ARDS, pneumonia, atelectasis, and pulmonary contusions and you can divide those up as focal b lines or diffuse b lines which ones do you want to talk about first mm, pneumonia we talk about pneumonia so let's talk about focal b lines first now pneumonia they've been described as being this is kind of this broad range here from eight to 76 percent of the time you'll see the pneumonia oh what eight so that sounds completely useless what do you mean you see it eight to 76 percent of the time that's i mean that's how it's described in the literature i'm not going to lie i'm not going to just like ignore the ones that say it's eight percent and in my situation in what my do you mean exactly eight to 70 i mean i've seen multiple studies on this and the sensitivity is usually quite a bit better for pneumonia than this numbers you're throwing out here well this is prevalence this isn't sensitivity this is prevalence okay yeah so it's kind of different so can, let, we'll go uh, back here i still would like to dig in a little more on that is can we yeah, yeah. Um, do you, do you want to? Do you mind if I talk to you about it in like one or two podcasts from now? Can we do that? All right. All right. Deal. Teaser. Teaser. All right. We'll talk more about pneumonia later. Let's let's talk about contusion here. Now look at these sensitivities and specificities. Now, Matt, what would you say about the specificities comparing ultrasound and chest X-ray? They look pretty similar, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Maybe chest X-ray, maybe even a little bit better, right? I mean, definitely within the same range. But in the emergency department, what do we care about? We don't want to miss. We don't want to miss. Yeah, we need sensitivities. Now, well. Although contusion, contusion is not that big of a deal. It's still a thing that it'd be but good to probably, diagnose. Yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have a patient that comes in and they have minor injury and they have nothing. They have no contusion, nothing like that. I'd be completely comfortable sending them home. But if the patient comes in and let's say they're, you know, let's say they're a seventy-five-year-old little frail female, um, the test X-ray looks fine, but I see a contusion on the ultrasound, I might treat her more aggressively. I might even watch her for a little bit longer and make sure that it doesn't get worse and that she can actually breathe well. So I'd, I would argue that it is useful. Okay, maybe, maybe not as useful as differentiating cardiogenic pulmonary edema from COPD, but I mean, this is just some extra you could add on top of your history and physical exam that can help you diagnose your patient more accurately quicker. So what does it look like? So uh, it looks like this. So you have these this little area right here. You see how around here there is just a white plural line. And then right in this area right here, you see these focal area of B lines. This is a patient I had actually that had a um, car accident, seatbelt sign, and I looked around that area and the check structure didn't show anything, but I found this focal area of B lines and was able to diagnose this guy with a pulmonary contusion. Now let's move on and talk about atelectasis. Honestly, atelectasis is the way that I actually see focal B lines the most. And I generally see them down here in the dependent regions of the lung. So we have our liver here, our diaphragm here. You see these vertical artifacts right here, Matt, Matt. I see them. All right. So those are B lines. Now there is one study it used an amazing gold standard of an MRI. It's kind of incredible. So what they did is they took pediatric patients that were scheduled to get a supine MRI, right? These guys all get atelectasis. It's normal. 
And they used ultrasound to try and see how often the ultrasound was able to actually pick it up. Now, in this study, they actually used a linear transducer. And a linear transducer works, but I would use a curved linear transducer. Um, you'll be able to see these beelines a lot easier. You see these things right here? All little beelines. And they found that the sensitivity and specificity was in the mid-80s, um, which is decent. Not bad. Not bad. Now, one thing you can do if you're not sure if this is maybe a basal or pneumonia versus atelectasis, especially in someone who's getting positive pressure ventilation, is you can actually increase that PEEP a little bit. This study found that you could increase the PEEP if a patient has atelectasis, and then increasing the PEEP would actually make those beelines go away. So, but would it not just go away with pneumonia as well? I don't, I don't think that's how pneumonia works, Matt. I, th I think pneumonia is just kind of this structure that's there, and it's not just, you know, de-recruited airways like atelectasis. The increased PEEP isn't going to clear up an infection? Not not usually. Um, although, that being said, I've never tried to do that. So if we're looking at a pure scientific point of view, maybe it does, but it would seem like it probably doesn't. We should, in, in maybe we should work on that. In all seriousness, is there a study actually differentiating the two, or is this just atelectasis? Does it go away or not? <laughs> There's no studies that actually com uh, directly compare the two. It's just these patients had atelectasis. They increased their PEEP. The atelectasis went away. Okay. All right. So what do you think of this guy right here? What does this kind of look like? Hmm. Looks like atelectasis a little bit, right? Kind of like what we were seeing before. Yeah, it's now, let me, interesting. Let me tell you this guy's story. This was a guy. It was a stoic, very healthy Kentuckian that was healthy because he'd never really gone to the doctor before. So he didn't have anything diagnosed. He had no medical problems. But... He had shortness of breath for about two weeks. Uh, we got an x-ray. He was found to have a large pneumothorax. We got a chest x-ray uh, that showed a large pneumothorax. And then we put a chest tube in, and the chest tube... Re-expansion pulmonary edema. You didn't even let me finish. Sorry. Go ahead. And then he got so, shorter no, breath. Hold, hold on. We put the chest tube in, Matt, and then you know what happened? He got more shorter breath. He got more shorter breath after the chest tube. That should have made him better. So, Matt, what do you think that is? Could it be re-expansion pulmonary edema? Absolutely. This is re-expansion pulmonary edema. And I put this here because you have to be a good physician. You can't just use ultrasound by itself. It's not a magic tool that will magically diagnose what's going on. You have to take everything, your history, your physical exam, and use it to figure out what's the best thing for your patient. You might even say it is a tool in your quiver, an arrow in your toolbox. So you're saying B-lines equals mm, Increased density. No, no, we don't know. It means increased density. Gotcha. And then you decide what that increased density is from. Exactly. So we talked about focal. Let's talk about diffuse. Now, we've already spent a good amount of time talking about cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So let's talk about the other two. Let's talk about interstitial lung disease and ARDS. Matt, which one do you want to talk about first? Mm, interstitial lung disease. All right, deal. So interstitial lung disease, you'll definitely see diffuse B lines, but you'll also see these other things, pleural line thickening, subpleural nodules, decreased lung sliding, increased A lines. Although the increased A lines is not something that I've seen clinically, but it's definitely described in the literature. This is a patient with interstitial lung disease. It's pretty severe interstitial lung disease, actually. Now, what do you see here, Matt? I see B lines. Okay, so a lot, lot of B lines. What else do you see? Um, some little dark space underneath the pleural line. This thing right here? Yeah. yeah, that's a subpleural nodule. So what's the difference between a subpleural nodule and a subpleural consolidation? That's a great question. So a subpleural nodule, you will see this irregular pleural line extend all the way with no real break in it. And then you'll see a little consolidation underneath. A subpleural consolidation, you'll see the pleural line and then a dip in that pleural line. And then it'll continue after that. So you won't see this white above that little hypoechoic collection there in a subpleural consolidation. This is a nodule. Now, besides being able to actually diagnose it, you can actually use this to estimate the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. It's kind of incredible. You can plug this in. There's a lot of numbers and letters and decimals and stuff. But if you plug in the number of B lines and plug it into this formula, you actually have a really good correlation, 0.8. Above 0.8 is actually excellent correlation with the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Now, convince me this is useful to me in any way whatsoever. I, I don't I actually don't think I can, Matt. Um, and that, I mean, it's important to understand that. I mean, this is not something necessarily that you should be doing to all your patients in the emergency department. But this to me shows that you can actually use ultrasound very accurately to diagnose your patient with pathology and that not only can you use it to diagnose it, but it can be used to actually estimate the pulmonary systolic pressure. And I don't expect you to actually do this in shift. I don't do this in shift, but important to know that it actually correlates very well. So the more B lines you have, the worse the patient's disease is. So you can actually prognosticate where that patient is likely to go based off of your B lines. So that's where it becomes important. Okay. All I right. kind of feel like you just wasted my time. Those dots kind of look like they're all over the place. If someone's smarter than us, actually does use this and has ever used this for this exact reason let us know 
at ultrasound md and at ultrasound pod yeah so let's move on you want to talk about some arts absolutely now ARDS, besides ARDS. diagnosing it ARDS. besides diagnosing it ARDS, the amount of b lines has actually been shown to correlate with a bunch of different markers so it correlates with the extra vascular lung water index the sofa score which we've been hearing a lot about because of the new sepsis criteria lung injury severity and the pao2 fio2 ratio all these things correlate with the amount of b lines that you have now the b lines here are going to be associated with skip areas, pleural line abnormalities, decreased lung slide consolidations, and pleural effusions as well. Now, there was this study that was, and I love this study. This study actually compared findings of cardiogenic pulmonary edema with findings of ARDS and found that a few of these findings were actually very sensitive for diagnosing ARDS. So if you look here, we have pleural line abnormalities, reduction in absence of lung sliding, and spared areas with consolidations. All these are highly sensitive. Now, when a test is highly sensitive, Matt, does it also mean that it's going to be highly specific? It's usually the opposite. Usually yeah. you can increase sensitivity and you're going to get decreasing specificity in general. Wow. Maybe yeah. not here. So very sensitive and very specific. So look for all of these findings if you're not sure if your patient has CHF or ARDS. Now, this is what it looks like. You see this area right here? There's a little spot. There's B lines all around, and there's a little spot without B lines right there. That is like a spared, spared area. That's yeah, a spared area. What do you think about this person right here? So we have B lines here, right? We got B lines over here. Now, what do you think about this area over here without B lines? What would you like call that? Arts. Right, spared area. Now, why do you think this plural line is so jiggly? Um, that looks faster than a lung pulse. I'm going to say somebody's shaking the crap out of this patient. Yeah, yeah. Shaking patient syndrome. Definitely sh shaking patient syndrome. Or um, it could be an oscillator. Oh, I thought you were going to say, or they're on one of those beds that you put a quarter in and they like vibrate really quickly. Do they have those at UK? I haven't actually been up on the floor at UK. It's in the ICU It's only. in the ICU. Yeah. Interesting. Level five care. It's level five. All right, so here's a big spared area. So you see lots of B-lines over here, lots of B-lines over here, and one area with no B-lines. This is what ARCH looks like. And in that same patient, you can look here. You can see a lot of B-lines, a lot of B-lines. And right here, you see see that consolidation right there? Subplural consolidation. It's a subplural consolidation. So you need to be you need to be a good clinician. You got to be a detective. You can't use the ultrasound in isolation. The ultrasound is a component. It's a piece of the puzzle. You can't just use it by itself to say every time this means this because that's not what happens. And what's important is uh, because studies like this come out. Now this study showed that you can actually have B lines in normal lung. What they did here is they looked at a hundred elderly patients, and 37 of those actually had B lines. And these were patients that were completely asymptomatic. And out of those, two out of the 100 actually had greater than three B lines per field of view in a particular field of view. So this patient had a positive zone, even in the absence of disease. So You're saying two out of the 100 patients. Yeah. But look at this study right here. Okay. This is why it's important. Because this study actually divided out those greater than 80 and those less than 80 and found that your presence of B-lines was less helpful if they were greater than 80 years old. Because it appears that if you're a little bit older, your lungs will make B-lines even in the absence of any known disease process. So if your patient's a little bit older, the presence of B-lines is going to be less helpful than if your patient's younger. She's different here, 5.8 with greater than 80 and 10.9 with those less than 80. Okay, I think that's a good point, but I think it's also important to point out that those likelihood ratios, although not great, are still better than the number you showed before for right. chest x-ray and exactly. physical exam. So exactly. they're still helpful, it's just not as meaningful in the elderly patient. Exactly. So if you look at these numbers, the negative likelihood ratios are still really good. You can see that they're both less than 0.1. So still useful to rule out the disease. All right. You ready to talk about pneumothorax? I was born ready. One week. Don't worry. You don't have to wait very long. In one week, we're going to give you some pro tips on ultrasound for pneumothorax. Now, don't forget...
not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it.